Part One, Lesser Hippias. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kevin Johnson. Lesser Hippias by Plato. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Appendix One. It seems impossible to separate by any exact line the genuine writings of Plato from the spurious. The only external evidence to them which is of much value is that of Aristotle, for the Alexandrian catalogues of a century later include manifest forgeries. Even the value of the Aristotelian authority is a good deal impaired by the uncertainty concerning the date and authorship of the writings which are ascribed to him and several of the citations of aristotle omit the name of plato and some of them omit the name of the dialogue from which they are taken prior however to the enquiry about the writings of a particular author general considerations which equally affect all evidence to the genuineness of ancient writings are the following shorter works are more likely to have been forged or to have received an erroneous designation than longer ones and some kinds of composition such as epistles or panegyrical orations are more liable to suspicion than others those again which have a taste of sophistry in them or the ring of a later age or the slighter character of a rhetorical exercise or in which a motive or some affinity to spurious writings can be detected or which seem to have originated in a name or statement really occurring in some classical author are also of doubtful credit while there is no instance of any ancient writing proved to be a forgery which combines excellence with length a really great and original writer would have no object in fathering his works on plato and to the forger or imitator the literary hack of alexandria and athens the gods did not grant originality or genius further in attempting to balance the evidence for and against a platonic dialogue we must not forget that the form of the platonic writing was common to several of his contemporaries Iskenes, euclid phaedo antisthenes and in the next generation aristotle are all said to have composed dialogues and mistakes of names are very likely to have occurred greek literature in the third century before christ was almost as voluminous as our own and without the safeguards of regular publication or printing or binding or even of distinct titles an unknown writing was naturally attributed to a known writer whose works bore the same character and the name once appended easily obtained authority a tendency may also be observed to blend the works and opinions of the master with those of his scholars to a later platonist the difference between plato and his imitators was not so perceptible as to ourselves the memorabilia of xenophon and the dialogues of plato are but a part of a considerable socratic literature which has passed away and we must consider how we should regard the question of the genuineness of a particular writing if this lost literature had been preserved to us these considerations lead us to adopt the following criteria of genuineness one that is most certainly plato's which aristotle attributes to him by name which two is of considerable length of three great excellence and also four in harmony with the general spirit of the platonic writings but the testimony of aristotle cannot always be distinguished from that of a latter age parentheses, see above end of parentheses, and has various degrees of importance those writings which he cites without mentioning plato under their own names e g the hippias the funeral oration the phaedo etc have an inferior degree of evidence in their favour they may have been supposed by him to be the writings of another although in the case of really great works e g the phaedo this is not credible those again which are quoted but not named are still more defective in their external credentials there may be also a possibility that aristotle was mistaken or may have confused the master and his scholars in the case of a short writing but this is inconceivable about a more important work 
e.g. the laws, especially when we remember that he was living at Athens and a frequenter of the groves of the academy during the last twenty years of Plato's life. Nor must we forget that in all his numerous citations from the Platonic writings, he never attributes any passage found in the extant dialogues to any one but Plato. And lastly, we may remark that one or two great writings, such as the Parmenides and the Politicus, which are wholly devoid of Aristotelian, one, credentials, may be fairly attributed to Plato on the ground of two, length, three, excellence, and four, accordance with the general spirit of his writings. Indeed, the greater part of the evidence for the genuineness of ancient Greek authors may be summed up under two heads only, one, excellence, and two, uniformity of tradition, a kind of evidence which, though in many cases sufficient, is of inferior value. Proceeding upon these principles, we appear to arrive at the conclusion that nineteen twentieths of all the writings which have ever been ascribed to Plato are undoubtedly genuine. There is another portion of them, including the epistles, the eponymus, the dialogues rejected by the ancients themselves, namely the Axiochus, de Justo, de Brutut, Demodocus, Sisyphus, Eryxias, which on grounds both of internal and external evidence we are able with equal certainty to reject. But there still remains a small portion of which we are unable to affirm either that they are genuine or spurious. They may have been written in youth, or possibly, like the works of some painters, may be partly or wholly the compositions of pupils, or they may have been the writings of some contemporary transferred by accident to the more celebrated name of Plato, or of some Platonist in the next generation who aspired to imitate his master. Not that on grounds either of language or philosophy we should lightly reject them, some difference of style or inferiority of execution or inconsistency of thought can hardly be considered decisive of their spurious character for who always does justice to himself or who writes with equal care at all times certainly not plato who exhibits the greatest differences in dramatic power in the formation of sentences and in the use of words if his earlier writings are compared with his later ones say the Protagoras or Phaedrus, with the laws? Or who can be expected to think in the same manner during a period of authorship extending over above fifty years, in an age of great intellectual activity, as well as of political and literary transition? Certainly not Plato, whose earlier writings are separated from his later ones by as wide an interval of philosophical speculation as that which separates his later writings from Aristotle. The dialogues which have been translated in the first appendix, and which appear to have the next claim to genuineness among the Platonic writings, are the Lesser Hippias, the Menexenus or Funeral Oration, the first Alcibiades. Of these, the Lesser Hippias and the Funeral Oration are cited by Aristotle, the first in the Metaphysics, the latter in the Rhetoric. Neither of them are expressly attributed to Plato, but in his citation of both of them he seems to be referring to passages in the extant dialogues. From the mention of Hippias, in the singular by Aristotle, we may perhaps infer that he was unacquainted with the second dialogue bearing the same name. Moreover, the mere existence of a greater and lesser Hippias, and of a first and second Alcibiades, does to a certain extent throw a doubt upon both of them though a very clever and ingenious work the lesser hippias does not appear to contain anything beyond the power of an imitator who was also a careful student of the earlier platonic writings to invent the motive or leading thought of the dialogue may be detected in xenophon memorabilia and there is no similar instance of a motive which is taken from xenophon in an undoubted dialogue of Plato. On the other hand, the upholders of the genuineness of the dialogue will find in the Hippias a true Socratic spirit. They will compare the Ion as being akin both in subject and treatment. They will urge the authority of Aristotle, 
and they will detect in the treatment of the sophist in the satirical reasoning upon homer in the reductio ad absurdum of the doctrine that vice is ignorance traces of a platonic authorship in reference to the last point we are doubtful as in some of the other dialogues whether the author is asserting or overthrowing the paradox of socrates or merely following the argument whither the wind blows that no conclusion is arrived at is also in accordance with the character of the earlier dialogues the resemblances or imitations of the gorgias protagoras and euthydemus which have been observed in the hippias cannot with certainty be adduced on either side of the argument on the whole more may be said in favour of the genuineness of the hippias than against it the menexenus or funeral oration is cited by aristotle and is interesting as supplying an example of the manner in which the orators praised the athenians among the athenians falsifying persons and dates and casting a veil over the gloomier events of athenian history it exhibits an acquaintance with the funeral oration of thucydides and was perhaps intended to rival that great work if genuine the proper place of the menexenus would be at the end of the phaedrus the satirical opening and the concluding words bear a great resemblance to the earlier dialogues the oration itself is professedly a mimetic work like the speeches in the phaedrus and cannot therefore be tested by a comparison of the other writings of plato the funeral oration of pericles is expressly mentioned in the phaedrus and this may have suggested the subject in the same manner that the clitophon appears to be suggested by the slight mention of clitophon and his attachment to thrasymachus in the republic and the theages by the mention of theages in the apology and republic or as the second alcibiades seems to be founded upon the text of xenophon memorabilia a similar taste for parody appears not only in the phaedrus but in the protagoras in the symposium and to a certain extent in the parmenides to these two doubtful writings of plato i have added the first alcibiades which of all the disputed dialogues of plato has the greatest merit and is somewhat longer than any of them though not verified by the testimony of aristotle and in many respects at variance with the symposium in the description of the relations of socrates and alcibiades like the lesser hippias and the menexenus it is to be compared to the earlier writings of plato the motive of the piece may perhaps be found in that passage of the symposium in which alcibiades describes himself as self-convicted by the words of socrates for the disparaging manner in which schleiermacher has spoken of this dialogue there seems to be no sufficient foundation at the same time the lesson imparted is simple and the irony more transparent than in the undoubted dialogues of plato we know too that alcibiades was a favourite thesis and that at least five or six dialogues bearing this name pass current in antiquity and are attributed to contemporaries of socrates and plato one in the entire absence of real external evidence for the catalogues of alexandrian librarians cannot be regarded as trustworthy and two in the absence of the highest marks either of poetical or philosophical excellence and three considering that we have expressed testimony to the existence of contemporary writings bearing the name of alcibiades we are compelled to suspend our judgment on the genuineness of the extant dialogue neither at this point nor at any other do we propose to draw an absolute line of demarcation between genuine and spurious writings of plato they fade off imperceptibly from one class to another there may have been degrees of genuineness in the dialogues themselves as there are certainly degrees of evidence by which they are supported the traditions of the oral discourses both of socrates and plato may have formed the basis of semi-platonic writings some of them may be of the same mixed character which is apparent in aristotle and hippocrates although the form of them is different but the writings of plato unlike the writings of aristotle 
seem never to have been confused with the writings of his disciples this was probably due to their definite form and to their inimitable excellence the three dialogues which we have offered in the appendix to the criticism of the reader may be partly spurious and partly genuine they may be altogether spurious that is an alternative which must be frankly admitted nor can we maintain of some other dialogues such as the parmenides and the sophist and politicus that no considerable objection can be urged against them though greatly overbalanced by the weight chiefly of internal evidence in their favour nor on the other hand can we exclude a bare possibility that some dialogues which are usually rejected such as the greater hippias and the clitophon may be genuine the nature and object of these semi-platonic writings require more careful study and more comparison of them with one another and with forged writings in general than they have yet received before we can finally decide on their character we do not consider them all as genuine until they can be proved to be spurious as is often maintained and still more often implied in this and similar discussions but should say of some of them that their genuineness is neither proven nor disproven until further evidence about them can be adduced and we are as confident that the epistles are spurious as that the republic the timaeus and the laws are genuine on the whole not a twentieth part of the writings which pass under the name of plato if we exclude the works rejected by the ancients themselves and two or three other plausible inventions can be fairly doubted by those who are willing to allow that a considerable change and growth may have taken place in his philosophy parentheses, see above end of parentheses, that twentieth debatable portion scarcely in any degree affects our judgment of plato either as a thinker or a writer and though suggesting some interesting questions to the scholar and critic is of little importance to the general reader lesser hippias introduction the lesser hippias may be compared with the earlier dialogues of plato in which the contrast of socrates and the sophists is most strongly exhibited hippias like protagoras and gorgias though civil is vain and boastful he knows all things he can make anything including his own clothes he is a manufacturer of poems and declamations and also of seal rings shoes strigils his girdle which he has woven himself is of a finer than persian quality he is a vainer lighter nature than the two great sophists parentheses compare protagoras end of parentheses but of the same character with them and equally impatient of the short cut and thrust method of socrates whom he endeavours to draw into a long oration at last he gets tired of being defeated at every point by socrates and is with difficulty induced to proceed parentheses compare thrasymachus protagoras callicles and others to whom the same reluctance is ascribed end of parentheses hippias like protagoras has common sense on his side when he argues citing passages of the iliad in support of his view that homer intended achilles to be the bravest odysseus the wisest of the greeks but he is easily overthrown by the superior dialectics of socrates who pretends to show that achilles is not true to his word and that no similar inconsistency is to be found in odysseus hippias replies that achilles unintentionally but odysseus intentionally speaks falsehood but is it better to do wrong intentionally or unintentionally socrates relying on the analogy of the arts maintains the former hippias the latter of the two alternatives all this is quite conceived in the spirit of plato who is very far from making socrates always argue on the side of truth the over-reasoning on homer which is of course satirical is also in the spirit of plato poetry turned logic is even more ridiculous than rhetoric turned logic and equally fallacious there were reasoners in ancient as well as in modern times who could never receive the natural impression of homer or of any other book which they read 
the argument of socrates in which he picks out the apparent inconsistencies and discrepancies in the speech and actions of achilles and the final paradox that he who is true is also false remind us of the interpretation by socrates of simonides in the protagoras and of similar reasonings in the first book of the republic the discrepancies which Socrates discovers in the words of Achilles are perhaps as great as those discovered by some of the modern separatists of the Homeric poems. At last Socrates, having caught Hippias in the toils of the voluntary and involuntary, is obliged to confess that he is wandering about in the same labyrinth. He makes the reflection on himself which others would make upon him. Parentheses, compare Protagoras, end of parentheses. He does not wonder that he should be in a difficulty but he wonders at hippias and he becomes sensible of the gravity of the situation when ordinary men like himself can no longer go to the wise and be taught by them it may be remarked as bearing on the genuineness of this dialogue one that the manners of the speakers are less subtle and refined than in the other dialogues of plato two that the sophistry of socrates is more palpable and unblushing and also more unmeaning three that many turns of thought and style are found in it which appear also in the other dialogues whether resemblances of this kind tell in favour of or against the genuineness of an ancient writing is an important question which will have to be answered differently in different cases for that a writer may repeat himself is as true as that a forger may imitate and plato elsewhere either of set purpose or from forgetfulness is full of repetitions the parallelisms of the lesser hippias as already remarked are not of the kind which necessarily imply that the dialogue is the work of a forger the parallelisms of the greater hippias with the other dialogues and the allusion to the lesser where hippias sketches the program of his next lecture and invites socrates to attend and bring any friends with him who may be competent judges are more than suspicious they are of a very poor sort, such as we cannot suppose to have been due to Plato himself. The greater Hippias more resembles the Euthydemus than any other dialogue, but is immeasurably inferior to it. The lesser Hippias seems to have more merit than the greater, and to be more platonic in spirit. The character of Hippias is the same in both dialogues, but his vanity and boasting are even more exaggerated in the greater Hippias his art of memory is specially mentioned in both he is an inferior type of the same species as hippodamus of miletus parentheses, aristotle politicus end of parentheses. some passages in which the lesser hippias may be advantageously compared with the undoubtedly genuine dialogues of plato are the following lesser hippias compare republic socrates cunning in argument compare lashes socrates feeling about arguments compare republic socrates not unthankful compare republic socrates dishonest in argument the lesser hippias though inferior to the other dialogues may be reasonably believed to have been written by plato on the ground one of considerable excellence two of uniform tradition beginning with aristotle and his school that the dialogue falls below the standard of plato's other works or that he has attributed to socrates an unmeaning paradox perhaps with the view of showing that he could beat the sophists at their own weapons or that he could make the worse appear the better cause or merely as a dialectical experiment are not sufficient reasons for doubting the genuineness of the work end of part one Recording by Kevin Johnson